Well, my goodness, if you can give me three minutes of your time, that would be wonderful. Um, I, it's such a privilege to be able to um, reflect on today's uh, excellent conference. I'll give you some observations. Now, I'm a, I'm a, um, a research methods person. That's what I, I've, I've spent my career doing research for the FE sector and in the FE sector but um, and, um, you know and, and I'm quite new in post so I'm, I've just got some observations um, we've seen today very strongly how action research has the power to change human thinking and behaviors congratulations everybody that's that's what it can do and it clearly has done um, just flagging up um next year's action research project the planning has just started for those and there are a lot of people here today who are not currently part of a cfem network now i am making absolutely no promises but i am just interested if there are people not currently part of a network who would be interested in pursuing action research um, either as part of this CFEM or more broadly um, could you put your details into the chat please really appreciate that and I'll try and get back to you or a colleague will so no promises about suddenly becoming a, you know a, a network partner or anything like that but if you're interested generally pop your details in I'd like to know about you okay um, it was very noticeable as an action research um, methodology. We talk about the action research cycle of, of consider, um, uh, research, design, implement, evaluate, tweak the design. And there, it's very notable how, although there were strong key themes um, from your project titles in that those big action research cycles, there were these sub or satellite or spin-off mini um, investigations going on all the way through. And I think that's a really good sort of model. We'll have our big key core cycle of what, uh, uh, for action research of what we want to think about, our key questions, but lots of little sub questions spin off that through the time. And that's only going to be more next year when we've got things thrown at us um, that we weren't expecting we've got a lot of uncertainty too um, and to embrace that as part of the action research process new questions do pop up need a little investigation to be able to then carry on with the main core um, investigation too so just an observation there um, going on to mastery specifically problem solving fluency reasoning you're flagging up as real issues for today's students. Now, you may think that's obvious, but part of my duty is to convey this to DFE. So it's a key message that you're giving me. So please don't not state the obvious to you, because sometimes it needs saying in stark and bold, uh, bold terms to policymakers. So thank you very much for that. Right, now here goes. The question I had in my head, and give me one more minute, is, so what can we now say about mastery and and the question being what are the conditions needed to implement a maths mastery approach in at level two maths in fe and particularly in gcse reset classes but i appreciate we've got you know people from your prison estate people from he we've got lots of different people involved got functional skills and so on too so what did i jot down from across all the projects that we heard today I jotted down things like whole college culture leadership support, curriculum planning, like whittling down, as Emma did and colleagues, to which parts of the GCSE or, or functional school syllabus actually do need to be focused on to get that grade, for, that get that um, grade four. So curriculum planning. So you've got whole college, curriculum planning, classroom practice, and then collaborative review of that. We've got sustainable finance. The CFEM programme is giving money to pay for staff time, but 
the CFEM programme won't last forever. How do we embed that if that's effective practice to give people staff time to do things differently? How do we embed that long term? Motivation and engagement. Well, mastery may have been your core theme, but motivation and engagement keeps coming up all over the place as a focus. Effective technology and the rapid, urgent uh, investigation of that required, you know, it, we, we, it's, an, it's obvious, it's running through every conversation um, um, at the moment. A CPD process needs to be in place. It's a condition it needs to be in place clearly from what you've told me and it involves a training input it involves collaboration discussion and it involves some sort of quality assurance some sort of critical review some sort of agreed process there so cpd characterized by training collaboration and quality assurance of some sort and a, and a beautiful one just to end on students talking more dialogic approaches that you've been investigating and enabling the student voice. It's, it we've heard it, haven't we, all the way through today. It can be counterposed by the traditional, almost parody of teachers talking a lot and then giving worksheets. It, it's need, it needs a good teacher-learner relationship there. And that dialogic, that, that dialogue and that student voice could be about attitudes, experience, knowledge and gaps. And it also gives the vital feedback that teachers need about their interventions, their trials, what they're testing out. So I'm going to leave it there and hand back to Lou. But thank you so much, everybody. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm actually going to, I took some notes during the day, so I'm actually going to read them. So forgive me if I look like I'm reading. Um, I'm just going to start off by quickly reminding you about what we've done and heard today um, to try and sort of give us a, a, a sort of overall feel of, of what, what's happened. So we started with Joss introducing the CFEM program and she mentioned the theme guides and the trials and then saying that action research is the third part and it's her favourite part. So we at the University of Nottingham were heavily involved with Joss's work at the action research groups and we're so proud to have been part of the Action Research Programme. For us, the Action Research has been one of our favourite parts as well. And I think you've all done absolutely brilliant. And having been there from the start, I know about your journeys. I know how much work must have gone into these projects. So well done, everybody. Um, so just thinking about the day, I, I was wondering, so what are the big themes that have come out of the day? Um, and there was a, a comment from Diane in the chat where she said, there's a common theme here of giving students a space to talk about how they feel. I'm just gonna stop for a minute. So if anybody else wants to write a common theme into the chat now, um, we'll just, I'll just give you a minute or two. Um, so Lou has said, again, we'll collect these. And I think it's great. I mean, I think the things that are coming up there are all so interrelated, aren't they? It's about relationships and, and mindsets and confidence and allowing space for, um, for, for those relationships to build. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing, reading the final reports and, and also to seeing what everyone else, everyone does next year and how they build on, re on the research from this year. So we started off, we first heard from Georgina and Kate from Nelson and Cohn and Runshaw College. And their question was, how do students respond to team-based competitive starter activity across the course of six weeks? Um, Georgina impressed us from the start. I, I was at Harlow, I think, where we had our first action research workshop. And Georgina came out with an amazing research plan. And everyone was terrified and thought, do we have to do something well, something as, as good as this. Um, but they certainly seem to have pulled off the research as well, and so well done to, that, to them. For me, I think that the uh, thing that stood out for me was they had a slide which said our most, our most pleasing findings. Students became more vocal in asking questions, peer-to-peer -peer and 
student teacher relationships improved what more could you ask for <laughs> um so debbie's just said love that first slide I, I did i thought it was great so generally it seems to have been a positive experience for all and, but i think it was interesting that as kate said this research was about a starter activity and the team found that the students enthusiasm wasn't carried over to the main part of the lesson so that might be a very good thing to be investigating next time uh, we then went on to Samuel Winters and Lindsay from Newcastle and Stafford College Group and Partners. And their action research question was, what does an engaging lesson look like and how do teachers teach them? What I found particularly interesting about this, this research was how the team used data from the learners to work out for themselves what an engaging lesson looked like. I really liked that, that sort of approach and then to try out um, teaching that engaging lesson. And I don't think that was my idea. I think it was um, their idea. <laughs> I like the way the team used the two different pieces of previous research to design their questionnaire by selecting questions appropriate to their context. I think that's a very effective way of using previous research. Um, and I found the results very interesting. And I was really surprised, as, as was Samuel and the rest of the team, I think, that technology was the most popular um, single factor that made lessons engaging. So brilliant presentation. There was a lot in it. Um, Kate Griffiths put it in the chat. Wow, so much info. Looking forward to reading the report. Thanks. Um, and I, I second that. A lot of information. I, I really look forward to reading the final report. In session two, we started off with Tuma and her team. Tuma and Jim pres presented. And their question was, how does the use of academic improvement mentors impact the learning experience and mindset of all of G recent GCSE math students? So I remember first discussing the project with Tim and the team at Brighton, and I thought, wow, what an interesting project. And it was, and it certainly turned out to be that way. I was really impressed with the planning, and I liked the slide where Jim explained exactly what they did. It was very clear. And in that slide, Jim also explained what was in the training pack which must have involved a load of work to put together. It looked really impressive. Um, but what a good idea to do a training pack like that. Uh, so uh, in common with a lot of the presentation today, the team didn't get all the data they hoped for, but thankfully they did get some. In the results section, it's interesting that the mentees really valued the age of the mentors. And we had lots of chat about that in, in the chat, but isn't that interesting? Um, and I, I also, I was just fascinated by the lesson observations and all those interesting findings. So I, lesson observations are time consuming and quite difficult to organize, but in this case, it really seems to have been very worthwhile. Uh, then we went on to Michael um, and Paul from Cambridge Regional, Regional College. How do student engagement coaches for maths help students to engage in learning maths? Uh, interestingly, this presentation almost appeared to build on, certainly continued the narrative from the Christ the King presentation, um, which is, was, I think, quite a few people remarked on that in the chat. So the beginning with the premise that students need someone they can relate to, perhaps more easily than teachers. And yeah, just put a comment in the chat about that as well. So Michael and colleagues reported on the challenges they had in recruiting coaches in their programme. And I remember discussions about that through the year. So it's lucky they eventually got three coaches in place. Um, and just wonderful that we could hear the audio interview with Georgie. It's an effective way of sharing findings and making it real for the audience. And I think Georgie had some interesting observations, such as having a safe space for the learners to be open and honest, allowing students to talk freely about their experiences. Georgie also talked about the potential positive effect of blended learning in that learners would actually know her from a face-to-face -face meeting, although two metres apart, um, before having the online interventions. Um, and I think a lot of people appreciated hearing firsthand from the coach. I know Joss wrote a comment in the, in the chat. She said, lovely to hear firsthand from the coach. And what I found interesting about that was the research revealed the need for coaches to observe lessons. Um, so after that, I joined a breakout room with Nick and Darren, 
And what I think is really great about the breakout room idea is that people get to relate the research they've just heard about to their own experience. And for me, it was interesting to hear what Nick and Darren, how they did that. For example, they talked about how they could use the ideas they'd heard about in their settings, such as having coaches in the lessons. Um, so then session three after lunch was Catherine, Neil, Vicky, Nick, Tom and Matt from Western College and Partners. And their question was, how do students respond in, to incisive questions in the thinking environment? This was an amazingly well-planned joint presentation with everybody doing their, their bits um, and all members of the team contributing. So, uh, so Catherine began by saying they would share a snippet in the field for the experience, which I think they really did do. Um, and so she started by explaining what the thinking environment is. Um, and then Tom went on to, with that really powerful idea of sharing some of the incisive questions with us and challenging us to answer them. So putting us in the position of the students, which I thought was very effective. And then Vicky gave us a summary of the data with an interesting slide giving all the stats. I like that. And then there were some recommendations at the end from Nick um, saying that thinking environment is not an add-on, but a way of being. I think that's what he was saying, but I, I think that's what I would agree with. Um, and then Tom came up with some conclusions about allowing students to feel heard and um, teachers feeling that they benefited from working on the thinking environment. And I like Georgina's comment in the, in the chat there really like the idea of learners being able to identify their own feelings slash emotions towards maths and the barriers this can bring, allowing them to reflect on their mindset and play an active role in combating their barriers. Um, and so then we went on to the presentation from Plymouth and Exeter with Deborah, Darren, Jane and Katie. And their question was, how do students respond to maths lessons outside the traditional uh, classroom environment? And again, I, so this was a recorded presentation, you'll remember. And again, another brilliant team effort in putting the presentation together. So what, I like the way the team described how they came to their final research questions, which is how do students respond to the outdoor environment? Because we all know what a struggle it was, not just for this team, but for almost all the teams to arrive at the research question. And I just think it's quite a good reflection to go through that, that process. I think Catherine also did that. Sort of, how did you eventually get to that question? Um, and so in this, this um, presentation, they talked about monitoring the students and to, to try and sort of measure, in quotes, their engagement. Um, and I thought that they, I was particularly interested in the observation schedule. So I look forward to reading more about that. But I also thought it was very interesting in this presentation to compare the two different colleges and try to unpick the contextual factors that might have accounted for the differences. Um, and again, in the, in the chat, Josh, Josh said, really interesting to see how this has worked across the different colleges. And then Lou responded, yes, love across site relationships. But, but the great thing about this presentation was that they came to the conclusion that learning outside the classroom was positive. And described to us their plans to extend the idea uh, with a lot and they had lo lots of plans for future research and for remote and face-to-face -face contacts. For me the, the biggest takeaway almost was students wanted to be involved in designing similar outdoor tasks in future years. I think that's a great result. Uh, and then the very last session was Debbie from Warwickshire College and her question was how do students respond to our growth mindset intervention? So once again, COVID and some other factors got in the way of this research being completed. Um, but Debbie talked about maths anxiety and provided us with a good overview of what maths anxiety is and explained that she's interested in overcoming maths anxiety in her students by developing resilience. And she talked about how to implement the interventions that she's got in mind, explaining to the students how the interventions work, for example, so they begin to own their own awareness of their learning. She talked about the power of yet. She talked about getting out of the boring zone and out of the panic zone and told us the anecdote about the eight girls who worked on the idea of the flipping hand. And so Debbie did do a bit of research. She had a questionnaire, baseline questionnaire, but she said she didn't do the rest. 
but she did tell us something of her results, which I found interesting, particularly that 75% of the students claim to have a positive mindset about the possibility of being good at maths. It's sad that we couldn't finish the research, but what a brilliant start and good place to begin with for next year's research. So I'm going to end off now. I'm just going to read out a comment from Lou on the chat right at the beginning, but she did repeat it later. Kudos to Joss for the AR training. I see a lot of research projects. What's notable about all of the, these are the ethics and the honesty about what didn't work. No bluffing. We learn equally as much from what, we, what didn't work as what did, if not more. And then Richard, towards the end, wrote, there are a lot of research ideas I'd like to see extended this year. And I would certainly second that. So uh, Lou has already said kudos to Joss for the training. I just want to add that I don't think we've really um, shown our appreciation for all the work that the RMLs that Steve, Richard and Shabner have done in supporting these projects. And so I think I'd like to finish my bit by acknowledging that. So jazz hands for them. So thank you everyone. Um, that's me done. Thank you very much and thank you everyone who's participated in any way this afternoon or this morning because it's been an absolute delight to be with you. As many of you know, uh, maths in FE is something that's been dear to my heart for many years and that I've been involved in um, as in FE and as a researcher. So it's absolutely thrilling to see so much work now going on to try and explore these really difficult and knotty problems of how we can get students to learn in a more effective way and to actually achieve more with their maths in colleges. So it's been a fabulous day, it's been really inspiring. And if we had to choose two topics to look at concerning students in FE, then I think maybe at this point in time on a very hot sunny after June afternoon, we might choose motivation and engagement because if you've been in a classroom, it certainly would have been an issue. And it's one of those things that comes up time and time again in the interviews that I do as the biggest problem that we're facing. The second thing, because we are sitting at home and not in a hot classroom, is technology. We will be choosing that now because of COVID, because of this um, big difference, the way we are operating and we're probably going to have to operate for some time. So we've got two absolutely top of the list topics today. Secondly, I just want to say how much I think has been achieved by those who presented today. I had some involvement in some of the day three events. I can see the distance that you've traveled in such a short time. And in view of the fact that there isn't a lot out there to go on and that it is such a complex area students are not easy to understand and there are lots of other factors that affect what happens in the classroom so you've done a fantastic job actually getting to grips with some of these knotty issues and you're doing that on top of your actual job which doesn't make it easy either but the whole problem itself um, we might sum up in in a paraphrase of some words I've heard many times before. If it was easy for these GCSE research students to learn maths, it would have happened by now. We wouldn't still be waiting. We wouldn't still be trying. If it was easy, it would have happened. It's not easy. And so we need all these bits of pieces in the puzzle and things that can help students progress. So I'm going to run through a few of my own reflections and just go through each presentation in turn but before we do that I'm going to ask you all a question. I want you to think, don't do anything for a minute, but just think what of what I've heard today, what one idea would you actually be inspired to implement in some way in your college? What's inspired you and what would you want to implement? What would you want to do now 
as a result of today. So don't put it in the chat yet, because that isn't the question. I just want you to think. So when you've got something in mind, my question is, what support do you need to do it? And before you all say money, if you're going to put money in the chat, which is where I'd like to do it, you've got to tell me what it's for. So money on its own is not an answer. What support do you need to get there? Is it specific expertise? Is it an example? Is it training? Is it the actual resources, particularly if it's technology? Is it more staff? What do you actually need to support you to get there? So I'm going to run through my learning journey today and just one or two reflections and apologies if I actually miss any names out or say anything incorrectly because it is hot in my room here and I've got a ton of notes. I've tried to make them some sense, but um, I might just make the odd mistake. But you're a very forgiving set of people, so it's going to be fine. So we kicked off today with Newham, Julie, Elizabeth and Mohammed. What a great way to start. It really brought our focus today to the learners, to the students. And I feel that's been something that's gone through all the presentations today, even those that were officially about data and technology, there's been a focus on the students. I love the creative approach here of actually getting to video students, getting them to reflect, getting them to think. It was great to hear their actual voices and to use a neutral interviewer so that there was more hope that we we're actually getting what the students were thinking and not what they thought the teacher wanted them to say, which is always a danger. And I like the way in which this theme came through of the need to grow their confidence. And once they got some confidence, there was a feeling that they could move forward. Secondly, then, we had Stanford and partners presented by Ross all about the interactive learning software. There's so much available to us, but it isn't just what's available, it's how we use it, isn't it? It's what we do with it. And my reflections there were very much around the fact that giving the students some choice was important because the choice gives them some ownership. And there was variation for them when the technology was used in a classroom situation alongside other methods. It reminded me um, of something that is often misconstrued really. Sometimes we look to technology as the answer to motivation and engagement. What we should be doing is considering how to motivate and engage students whilst we are using technology. The two are different things. Technology is a medium of a way of approaching the teaching, but we still have to think about how to motivate and engage using technology. It isn't just an answer in itself. And then we went on to Leeds, Manta, Johnny, and um, Richard, I know his name was on the, the title slide. I know Carol was um, here as well. I thought this was really interesting too about this online maths resources and these mixed responses um, to paper um, and, and technology and using a computer. So these mixed responses are important because that's exactly what I've heard as well from focus groups of students. Some of them absolutely love being able to have that independence and try things out without someone on the shoulder but others really don't like it and they want to be told or they want to have something that they feel more comfortable with and so we come back again to the learner we come back to a learner um, focused approach but an appropriate learner focused approach and that's really hard to manufacture and create so in the lakes we got to a different aspect with Anna and Sandy the dedicated classroom, creating a physical environment 
that helped then create, I think, a social environment for the learning of maths. And again, I think this is important way in which we think about the social space. The physical space sets the background and the framework, but how we use it again gives us a social space where learners may feel more comfortable to actually engage with maths and feel that they are somewhere. So often they felt isolated in the past and they need to feel comfortable. So social and physical spaces, we need to create them. That seemed to come through to me quite clearly. On to Wilberforce and Franklin. And thank you to um, Daniel, and I think Paul and Stuart and Lucy, also there. And here we've got something that was quite um, different in that it's, it was something that is easily transferable from one college to another because we looked at GeoGebra in particular and looked at the potential here. Uh, interestingly, the unexpected does happen, doesn't it? You know, you, you weren't the only one who didn't get the end of what you wanted to do because of COVID, but you still achieve something really important in those first steps of investigating and exploring this area. And the first steps, it's important to get those right. So um, I love that and I felt that for once we had got something that was more readily transferable because much of what we do, because there's such wide variations between colleges, even in the physical layout of sites and not sites, it's hard to actually identify things that you can take and use because they need adaptation to your context and your environment. On to Harlan, Vivian and Becca, thank you so much for your lovely, honest presentation in which you covered many of the things that um, I might have expected, I think, uh, to do with motivation and engagement, but it was lovely the way that you'd explore those for your students. You started with something about GCC awarding body analysis, but actually you'd done so much more with it to bring it down to student level, to think about drilling down, and then to think about the agility that you need in being responsive to students, overcoming their fears, helping them believe they can do it, um, and actually getting them involved. And all those things came through to me as really key elements in, in that approach, which started from what looked like very high level data coming down to the student level. Um, and finally, math coaches, we heard about math coaches and mentoring last week, and we're here again. Um, I love the way that you set things up to look at different ways of doing it. You thought about those ways. And again, a lot of this was about giving students attention, wasn't it? Getting them the attention that they need to hit the, the barriers and just break them down. It was about getting students to believe in themselves, about having that more personalized support which is really hard to do, particularly when we've got financial constraints. But there seems to be a theme here coming through that today has been very much about the student, about being aware of the student's needs, about having that responsiveness, ability in different ways to respond, um, about giving them attention, getting to know them, having the relationship as a teacher, but finding other ways of giving them that relationship and that extra support. So to me, this has been really rewarding and really interesting. And I'm reminded by something that um, a teacher said to me some time ago when they talked about the difficulties of their job of teaching math in FE. They said, yeah, it's really difficult. It is difficult, but it's actually really worthwhile. And that's why they're doing it. So both doing the teaching and doing the research to unpick these knotty problems is difficult, but it is worthwhile and we need to do it. And in the same way, you know, if we invest time and attention into students in different ways, we will get the rewards. Thank you very much, everyone who's contributed again. I'm sure everyone here has felt that same level of inspiration that I felt 
but obviously in different ways because we're in different positions and we're different uh, working conditions. So it's been really inspiring. And for me, there's been so much to actually build on here. And I'm really keen to see that we think about this as a place to start and a, and a foundation to build on. Um, I really like the fact that we've got some originality and some creativity here. But in producing all that originality and creativity, you've also got the discipline of actually producing a credible piece of research. And getting the blend of those is really quite difficult. So some of you, I think, have been really brave. You've all been very thorough. And I can identify with that struggle behind the research because you all produce these wonderful slick presentations, not like I'm doing, um, and you've got it. You know, and it, it looks great and we're all appreciative, but behind that slick presentation and those conclusions that you've drawn, there's a real struggle in research. Um, you're fighting to make sense of what you get. And the sense making is a really important bit. You can't, you can't rush it. You can't make sense of things unless you really worked your way through them. And of course, the time is always an issue. And the time's an issue because you've got another job. And even when you haven't got another job, like me, you still don't seem to have quite enough time to do enough of that sense making and, and and analysis that you'd always want to do. So there are two things you're struggling with, and in some ways much the same as students are struggling with. Um, you've highlighted today how there are time pressures on students as well as motivation. They've got their vocational course, their vocational learners, they've got all this stuff outside college, which I think Grimsby reminded of, as of, that impacts on the time that they spend on maths. Um, and they're also struggling with how to make sense of maths. So your struggles and theirs have some similarity. I was particularly noticing today that several of you talked about vocational learners. In essence, they're in college for another reason and they're learning vocational skills, vocational knowledge in a vocational sort of setting, educational setting, but vocational emphasis. And maths is still the bit of the add-on. We don't really want it to be like that, but it still is. So we have to think about the vocational um, setting in which these students are learning and the sort of learning they're taking, that's taking place and see how maths, how we can appreciate that and understand that and use it in our teaching of maths. So they're bringing all this stuff, we've talked about this before, but to me there's a lot of blending here, a lot of blending of things together. So we've, you've targeted some specific problem areas this morning and this afternoon, as well as some things that might be more generic or have some generic um, implications. But I'm really, I was really thrilled that some of these are quite specific and there are lots of bits here that need unpicking and unravelling. Now, I don't know what's changed your thinking and what image might be in your mind now, but just for a few seconds, can we just think about that? What has actually changed your thinking today? You're thinking about students, you're thinking about your job, you're thinking about teaching. What has changed your thinking, your view. During lockdown, I found a few things to do that I wouldn't normally do. And one of them was I found a box that came from my mother's house that was actually full of um, embroidery threads. I'll just show you what I mean because some people might not know what it is. It's just one of those things and you sew with it and they're all colourful. But the box was actually completely muddled up and you've got all these threads in a mess. And I took one look at it and thought, why bother? Why bother untangling all these bits of embroidery thread? What use is it ever going to be? But actually it is, 
because having had the time and the patience to unravel them, I was actually able to start producing something. And you begin to put the threads, you unravel the threads and you start to recreate them into something new. And it just made me think this afternoon of that way in which we get the students and they're all tangled up and messed up with maths and they don't see how one bit fits with another and they don't see how it's ever going to be make any sense. But if we have the patience and we give them the time and they have the time to spend, then we can unravel the threads and we can recreate an understanding of mathematics. I'm just going to run through the presentations and just highlight one or two things that they prompted in my thinking. They nudged me in a certain direction. They might not have been the key thing about the presentation, but they gave me a nudge. And so we started this morning with Gateshead, with Sands and Marianne. Lovely presentation there about um, topic-based formative assessment, enabling individualized learning, about that flipped learning approach and how that worked. There was so much interesting data here and that they were able to dig into. And when we actually saw you digging into it, we saw how actually it all became quite individualized. The tracking was important, but the individualization of that was important. So we weren't looking for the blankets. We were looking for students actually having a different experience that's different from school. Something we kept returning to again in other presentations, we had students feeling valued, having this relationship with a teacher, with students themselves having some control, some agency, some involvement in their own learning and growing in confidence. And again, it, although this was actually about the use of um, a particular approach, the principles that it was addressing and the things that came out were quite, again, those generic things that are really important about students feeling valued, having a relationship with the teacher and having this uh, ownership in some way of their own learning, being involved as individuals. We went on to Grimsby, to Lee and Ali, and thank you so much for that one. These barriers for their GCSE research students reminded us again that one size does not fit all. It was that individualisation that came through, the fact that with the mass motivators, they, there was a toolkit of different ideas and ways and techniques and strategies to deal with learners. And it's having that big toolkit, isn't it? And knowing what to do with it, how to apply the right tool at the right time. I get a toolkit out, I haven't got a clue which, which tool to use. So I tend to sort of uh, use the wrong one, but when you're skilled and you have your toolkit, a motivating toolkit and you can help students deal with these problems then this is effective but again it's the individualization that came through. Um, Nua, Julie, Elizabeth and Mohammed. again a lovely presentation here about something very specific now about a group of students where the second language is actually a barrier to learning maths. I'm so pleased that somebody's looked at this because it's one of those things that is bigger in some colleges than others simply because of your student cohort. But it's so important to try and get through those barriers because you're opening up futures for students here. And I've actually interviewed quite a number of students who are second language students who've moved on, who've been able to say, once I got through the language problem, I could do the maths. Um, and but I think there's a wider application here as well. It reminded me that sometimes it's very time intensive what we do. But if it's time intensive, but it actually hits the centre of the problem, then that's time better spent than having twice as much time, but never hitting the centre of the problem, isn't it? It's about time and effect and getting a good balance here of short time but maximum effect but I love the technique there and the way in which she worked. Brighton we moved on to with Chelsea 
thank you so much for a thoughtful presentation here about how you were able to work with teachers to train them. It's really important that we don't just think about what to do, but how to get ourselves as teachers to the point where we can do it. And the same with technology, it's getting ourselves to the place of, of using it in the right way, in an effective way, not just knowing what it can do or might do. So it's getting ourselves trained, getting there. And I, you, get, you place some lovely emphasis there on the training and about the way in which there was openness and integrity in the teachers that they didn't feel they could do this with the students until they were ready. They needed to be ready, it couldn't be rushed. Time was important, but lovely that they were beginning to see the value of it and that you've got somewhere to move on from there. Westminster Kingsway and Chris, um, and the absent Angela, so thank you to her too. Um, so again, inspiring in terms of what you were able to do with a sort of flipped learning approach, but how your research threw out the importance of the discussion with the learner as well, the way in which the dialogue changed and it all became more collaborative. So again, we're talking about the potential of data and technology, but we're talking about how to use it with that individualised personal approach as well that the students do value. So they're getting this blending of the best bits of both, which would be great, wouldn't it? And a similar thing here with USP and Giannis and uh, Saval, the technology here, so imaginative and creative in terms of exploring something that isn't widely explored at the moment, um, at least not to my knowledge, but um, again, thinking about um, how that impacted on the students and what, what effect it really had on, on their understanding. It's so hard for them to do the multi-step thinking, isn't it? And one of my conclusions from my time teaching in FE was I could teach the students to follow the procedures. I could teach them to do things. I couldn't teach them to think. And it's so important when we get to these multi-step problems that students can think through a strategy or a way to move to the next step, a way to get to the answer. Now, I've said quite a lot today, but I am really impressed by everything that I've seen um, in the three of the four sessions that I've been able to get to. And it was a joy being involved in a small way in the action research itself during the process in which you were developing these ideas and how to really research the question that you're posing yourselves. I think it's some brilliant work that's been done but as I said at the beginning it's time to now reflect and think how can we build on this? I love the way that um, back early, the, early on I think um, Again, it was Grimsby, you reminded us of the literature. And we need to remember what's already been done. So we're not reinventing the wheel over and over again. We're not starting with a blank sheet. We're starting where others have been and made a small imprint. And we're starting now with a big set of quite small, but action research projects that have been done in particular contexts. Where do we move on? How do we build? Well, we're still continuing to build. And I'm hoping, I'm going to leave you with one other real image now of, of the way in which we need to blend and think these things together. Students are complicated. It's a multifaceted problem of dealing with students who've not had success with maths in the past. We need to be different, but we can't deny the, the bits that are already there, the memories they bring, the habits they bring. So this is my second bit of COVID crafts, as I call it. When we start getting these things together, we can actually make something interesting out of them. And in this particular example, you've got bits of old material that got discarded and you've got bits of new material. The old material is there experiences from school, experiences of the past, then new material is what we stitch in. And if we get the blend right, 
then we might have something that's actually much more worthwhile than lots of old bits of material. So let's make something new out of the old. Thank you.